Hello and welcome to the Share Life Speaker Series. My name is Chris and I'm a part of the Share Life team. Our series is an opportunity for parishioners of the Archdiocese of Toronto like you to meet those who serve our community through Share Life agencies. They have a wealth of insights to share on topics that impact us deeply. And tonight we'll be talking about end of life care. But before I introduce our very special guest, I would just like to mention a couple of points of housekeeping. After our presentation, those joining us via Zoom will have an opportunity to ask your questions, and you can do so using the Q&A function on your screen. It should be right there with the other Zoom controls. Please use that rather than the chat box, and we'll get to as many questions as we can. And secondly, yes, we will be recording this presentation. We'll send the video tomorrow to registered participants and we'll post the link on Share Life's social media channels. Now, let's introduce our guest. Father Matthew Durham is a Catholic priest with the Diocese of Hamilton. He's also an experienced hospice palliative care administrator. His doctorate focused on healthcare administration, and he currently serves as the executive director of Hospice Palliative Care and Community Development for, for the St. Elizabeth Foundation. This includes overseeing Journey Home Hospice, a wonderful and very new project that he's going to tell us all about. Father Matthew, over to you. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Share Life, uh, for, inviting, for inviting me to be part of this evening and to share a little bit about uh, my passion, which is uh, hospice and palliative care, as well as uh, some very special projects for us, which include the Journey Home Hospice, as you mentioned, and some other, some other highlights that I'll share with you this evening. And so we, we prepared a bit of a, a presentation for you. So tonight, uh, I've been invited to share with you a little bit about uh, the palliative care journey for all of us on the call tonight, um, for perhaps a loved one in our, our network, uh, family or friends, and also about, uh, to talk a little bit about what about those in our society on the margins um, who may not have a home or may not have a family and those social supports that we, we enjoy. Next slide, please. Before I, I go into that, I thought maybe I should share a little bit about uh, the ministry that I do in, in healthcare, and that's with uh, St. Elizabeth Healthcare, um, originally founded in, in Toronto. Next slide, please. And the purpose of our organization of St. Elizabeth Foundation, or SE Health, as some might know it, is, is to bring hope and happiness. And, and that sounds uh, simple, um, but it's, it really isn't when you think about it. But at the end of the day, if, if we can bring a little bit of hope and happiness uh, to folks' lives, um, whether that's through simple interaction or healthcare, um, and or changing their lives through, through our care and end of life, I think um, it's important to bring hope and happiness. Next slide, please. So a little bit about St. Elizabeth. Uh, we have uh, this year, actually, just now we're celebrating 115 years of service in Canada and founded uh, the Cardinal of the Day in the Archdiocese of Toronto. He called together um, four lay women who are nurses uh, to care for uh, the most marginalized of Toronto at the time, mostly the homeless and uh, single women with children. And so for 115 years, um, we have been doing that, uh, growing right across the country now, uh, serving over 2,100 people a day, uh, doing mostly home care in people's homes, going nurses, PSWs, um, occupational therapists, et cetera, going to people's homes, providing care in their home. And we're a team now of, of over 8,000 people stretching across the country. And I'm happy to report that 97% of our patients um, that we do serve uh, would recommend us uh, to their family and friends. Next slide, please. St. Elizabeth uh, has a robust offering of services. As I said, our home care, our integrated health solutions, we've provided over 40 million people in Canada, the US and beyond uh, with care. Uh, we have a dedicated research center. It's very important for St. Elizabeth to always be ahead uh, of the curve of what's going on uh, in healthcare and where we can better serve our patients and their families. We have a global team that advocates and collaborates with other countries to help bring um, care solutions to their people. 
We have a Liz, which is our um, resource for caregiver support. And there's so many of us uh, on this call today who I imagine are caring or have cared for people um, in their circle and to have those supports in place to be able to get help uh, or resources or teachings and to, to better be able to support our loved ones is so important. We're always looking at new models of care uh, in healthcare and home care. And so whether it's through our HOPE initiative or COURAGE initiative and different nursing initiatives uh, to, to change the way we, we do care and better provide care where people want it most and that's in, in their place of choosing for their home of choice. And lastly, our Indigenous health and our end of life uh, care through our St. Elizabeth Foundation. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So I think thought we should go over a little bit to give you a sense of our time together this evening. And so um, we'll look at the why and the what. What is hospice palliative care? Why, why choose hospice palliative care? Um, how do you access hospice palliative care in your community? Introducing Hopeline, which is a new initiative in the Archdiocese, looking at hospice palliative care, again, for the, the most marginalized or the vulnerable folks in our society. I'll give a little tour and intro into our patient stories uh, of Journey Home, so you get a sense of what we're doing there. And then lastly, if, if people want to get involved, um, opportunities to how, to how to support this work uh, and get involved in it. Next slide, please. So, you know, the why. Uh, why should we be doing this? Well, because it's the gospel message um, and as well as should be our human concern to imitate the Good Samaritan. We should be concerned uh, with the care of every human person, of every suffering person, and we should do so with great mercy and compassion. And I think we also must remember that we need to support the spiritual care of the sick, the frail of the dying and and those bereaved within our communities, our parish communities, our, our cities, our towns, municipalities, um, again, with special attention to those who are suffering in both mind and body. Next slide, please. So the what? What is uh, hospice palliative care? And hospice palliative care is aimed at relieving suffering and improving the overall quality of life of our patients and their families who are living with or dying from advanced or life-threatening or life-limiting illnesses, and also those um, that are left behind. How do we care for those left behind? Palliative care is a, a special kind of health care for individuals and their families. And you're going to hear this throughout um, my presentation this evening. Is It's not just the patient, but their entire uh, network, their family, or maybe it's a chosen family of friends and supports. Uh, that that Hospice palliative care services are wrapped around all of those folks. And it's usually uh, hospice palliative care uh, for advanced care in terms of when we speak about residential hospice services. And of course, the goal is always to provide comfort and dignity for the person living with their illness, as well as supports for their wraparound family. An important objective of palliative care is relief of pain and other symptoms. And we often think of just pain and symptom management when we think of, of pain management, but there's also um, psychosocial, social, cultural, emotional, spiritual care that need, those needs need to be met as well. And so hospice care builds an interdisciplinary team um, of wraparound services of not just physicians and nurses, personal support workers, but also spiritual care providers social workers, complementary therapies like art therapy or music therapy, um, to really to wrap around care around the individual and their entire family. Next slide, please. An important uh, piece to remember when we discuss good hospice palliative care is that uh, hospice palliative care neither hastens death nor prolongs life. The goal at the end of the day of hospice pall palliative care is to improve the quality of life for patients and their loved ones. And, and I think that's so important that we keep that at the forefront of our minds when discussing palliative care. It's important to also remember that palliative care services are helpful not only when a person is approaching death, so usually a residential hospice services are three months life expectancy, 
but also in the earlier stages, there are a lot of hospices in our communities um, offer wellness programs, psychosocial support, uh, spiritual care, various counseling opportunities, and opportunities to, to discuss what you're experiencing um, with other people experiencing the same journey. And so it's really important that, that when a, a, a diagnosis is, is had uh, or made, that individuals reach out to their hospices to, to get that support earlier on so they can get on with their living, um, however long that might be. It's important to remember too that um, palliative care is not just stopping everything. Uh, sometimes um, when there's no more opportunities for a cure um, through treatment, that some treatments do continue um, and those treatments are to help pain and symptom management. And so that often happens through radiation or chemotherapy or, or different other treatments um, that the oncologist, the palliative oncologist would, would prescribe and work with the hospice team um, to create your care plan. And again, I know I've said it ad nauseum, but the importance of uh, families benefiting from the support because as a great mentor of mine taught me early, early on in my, my ministry in palliative care was that there's two things uh, that folks worry about when they're given an end-of-life diagnosis, and that's, will my pain and symptoms be under control, uh, and will my family be taken care of? And I think that's what the hospice movement across our province of Ontario and, and beyond in Canada strives to achieve, is if we can take good care of pain and symptom management with wraparound services, and the families also feel that support and care, uh, if the loved one can find a, a peaceful transition um, to, to our creator, to, to heaven. Next slide, please. So folks might ask, so how do you access um, hospice palliative care? If there's a lot of folks who haven't been on this journey with someone, um, whether it's themselves, their loved one, family member, a friend. And so how do you gain access to hospice palliative care? And um, most people don't realize this, but it's self-referral. You can, you can contact your local hospice and, and make a referral for yourself um, or a loved one. And they will, they will meet with you um, either virtually or at, at their hospice offices and discuss opportunities of service that are available in that area. For a more advanced uh, diagnosis or, or prognosis, um, around three months life expectancy, a physician or an oncologist may make, or a GP, uh, your family doctor, may make a referral to the hospice uh, after discussing it with you or your loved one as an opportunity for care. And then other um, folks in the spiritual care um, world, uh, social work, et cetera, Anyone who you might be seeing for support is able to help with that call and, and even make the call on your behalf um, or your loved one's behalf. So who uh, who can access? Again, any any patient, uh, any family or chosen family in that circle, as long as they have the patient's consent. And it's important to remember that uh, there's no cost. So hospices across our province, Ontario, do not charge for services for hospice care services. And they do that because of the generosity uh, of the communities that we, that hospices serve, um, heavily relying on donations, but also in particular for residential services, um, there is 50% uh, government funding for residential services. So where do you turn? And luckily in the Archdiocese of Toronto, we are unfortunately faced with this situation uh, of an end-of-life prognosis and diagnosis, um, there's a newly um, created hope line uh, that has just been launched in the Archdiocese. Next slide, please. And the hope line, um, you know, it was uh, a project, um, again, of the, of the Archdiocese and, and supported by Catholic Charities, uh, financially supported by Share Life, so thank you all on this call and, and operated by St. Elizabeth, the organization I, I spoke of earlier. And it, they, the reason for it was in, in conversations with our three organizations, we were talking about you know, what, what happens when someone has 
an end of life diagnosis. They've, they've just met with their physician. They've gotten this news. It's totally overwhelming. They may have or may not have someone with them to digest that information. Uh, and, then, and then they go home and they, and they don't know what to do next, um, particularly if you've not been on a journey with someone in the situation. And so the archdiocese share life and St. Elizabeth wanted an opportunity to create a hotline or sorry, a hope line in which uh, patients or families could call and, and get some advice on what services might be available in their local community. And because of the, the vastness of, of the archdiocese, uh, it, there's no cookie cutter approach to what services are available in various communities. And so having somebody um, who has the background, who has done the research and, and has tools in which to, to help provide information on what services can you access in your community, uh, whether it be hospice palliative care, um, whether it be a palliative care unit in the hospital, um, whether it be community palliative care in, in your home or a home-like setting. And so that's uh, the impetus of the Hope Line. And, and the Hope Line, again, is available to anyone in the Archdiocese who requires end-of-life care supports and looking at holistic care um, for the patient, again, their caregivers, and their extended networks. Next slide, please. It's important, uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm using a lot of language around hospice and, and palliative and palliative care units. And so maybe I'll take a moment and just distinguish uh, some definitions um, that we use in, in defining the differences between the, these levels of care. And so hospice palliative care uh, is really a philosophy of care and, and it's around wraparound services of the whole person and their family. And that's uh, again, pain and symptom management, but also psychosocial supports, spiritual care, and all the complementary therapies that you can imagine. In addition to whole army of volunteers who act and wrap around the, the family as well and the patient to provide the best end of life care. That usually happens in a community like setting, uh, in a hospice like setting, or day hospice or, or wellness programming. Uh, palliative care in the home, again, happens in the home, is often um, works with community agencies like St. Elizabeth or SE Health. And, and brings in palliative care, uh, good pain and symptom management uh, into the home and other wraparound services uh, for folks. And then palliative care units uh, in our hospitals uh, provide palliative care rooms um, that, that provide good pain and symptom management to the individual during their end of life journey. So with that, those definitions there, I thought, I would share with you some principles of um, the Hope Line and, and what sort of um, in understanding what we were trying to achieve and how we made decisions on what resources would be offered. And, and so the Hope Line understands how important values-based care is for the people of the Archdiocese of Toronto, particularly during their end-of-life journeys, and, and provides referrals um, to programs and services that embrace the principles that I'll share with you next. First principle being that organizations that we would that we would give referrals to or, or offer their contacts or connect would be um, they're committed to the best possible palliative care and most effective means of pain and symptom management to lessen the intensity and the extent of, of, pain, of patient and family suffering. We'd make referrals um, to organizations that provide counseling support and understanding of patients, their families and friends, of their total person, that is the whole person, the physical, emotional, spiritual issues that they may be experiencing, and that the organization is committed to enhancing the quality of life for people at end of life. So we don't know how often, how long that time might be, but however long it is, we want, we want people to enjoy a quality of life for however that is, long that is. And lastly, we, we wanted to make sure organizations embrace the understanding that uh, the goal of hospice care, of palliative care, is to improve the quality of life for patients and their families, and that the treatments not hasten death, 
uh, and nor prolong life against uh, the wishes of the patient. Next slide, please. And so, uh, again, the, the Hope Line, you'll be hearing more about it uh, in the coming uh, weeks and months and in your parish bulletins um, through Share Life and through other resources of the Archdiocese uh, that, that we hope will be a, a useful tool um, for folks uh, and a resource that um, in, in time of need um, that is quite frightening that there you have somewhere to turn to, someone to turn to, to help guide you through that journey. Next slide. So I'll pause there for a moment and, and we've shared a little bit about what hospice and what palliative care is, uh, particularly for the general population uh, and what, what services are available. But one of the issues that um, the St. Elizabeth Foundation um, was grappling with a few years back was, well, we know, you know, there was a, a study done right across the country. And in that study, we asked people, if you could choose where you wanted to die, well, where would that be? And the majority of, of Canadians wanted to die at home if at all possible. And uh, so slowly as a, as a province and a country, we're trying to provide more and more good palliative care and hospice palliative care services um, to our residents. But then the question came up for us, well, where do you go to die if you don't have a home? And, and so uh, we, we pulled together a group of folks in Toronto and started having conversations around what would this look like? What were the specialized training and needs um, of our patient population and the staff that and volunteers that would come in. And so uh, in, in 2018, um, St. Elizabeth Foundation uh, opened uh, Journey Home Hospice and, and to serve the, the homeless and the most vulnerably uh, housed or socially isolated folks in, our, in the Archdiocese of Toronto. And so in that model, uh, it would be like a traditional hospice uh, in the sense of 24 seven uh, high quality healthcare. Um, it'd be, it's welcoming and you'll see in a video I'll share shortly, um, uh, a beautiful environment uh, for an end of life journey. Just like a traditional hospice uh, setting, residential setting, we have an interdisciplinary team of physicians, uh, nurses, personal support workers, social workers, our spiritual care providers, our complementary therapies, and we couldn't do any of this work without our wonderful group of volunteers who really are essential to the model of a hospice. We obviously believe in a holistic care approach that addresses pain and symptom management, psychosocial needs, the spiritual needs, and we do so in a flexible, responsive, and respectful manner. So it's again, there's no cookie cutter approach, but what one individual might want in their space is different from another. And so just being open to that and pivoting, uh, and making adjustments to the care plan as needed. Our staff uh, and volunteers all um, mandated and must take um, enhanced training. In addition to all of their hospice palliative care mandatory training, they take uh, training in trauma-informed, uh, culturally safe and harm-reducing approaches to care within that hospice setting. And lastly, uh, it was always the vision um, for St. Elizabeth uh, to not just have um, the services available in, in the downtown core of Toronto, but how could we become a teaching and learning facility in which we could not just train young people to come in and learn this model of care and take to their various professions, um, but also how could we help other communities found such models and where we can, we would bring satellite journey home hospices and where we can't, we would assist other organizations build program capacity. And then beyond, um, we're looking at now, uh, you know, who, who in our society are on the margins and, and we all know the, the need is, is great. And so we're currently working with Corrections Canada, with organizations that serve physical um, folks suffering with physical or, or cognitive disabilities uh, and our indigenous uh, communities 
and how can we uh, offer uh, this specialized form of hospice palliative care to other communities um, in our province and our country? Next slide, please. A little uh, snapshot of um, sort of key developmental milestones in our in our project. Uh, again, in 2018, we opened a four bed pilot in downtown Toronto, um, graciously hosted by Homes First Society, um, which is social housing in Toronto. Um, in 2020, we were in COVID and uh, we weren't sure if we were going to be able to launch our campaign to open uh, our 10 bed model, um, uh, but we knew the need was great. Um, there was a wait list and, and we thought we can't wait, uh, we have to do this. And, and so we were so lucky for our, our um, capital campaign donors who stepped up during the pandemic and allowed us to complete the renovations and open our 10 bed model just before Christmas in 2020, December 23rd. In 2021, um, we opened three uh, chronic hospice beds. And, and you might say, what, what is a chronic hospice bed? And what, what we found was that our population, um, the homeless population vulnerable housed, um, come into needing our care. Uh, they come in very sick um, with appropriate diagnosis and prognosis. But after a few weeks of good pain and symptom management, um, three squares a day, and access to all the love from our, our staff and our volunteers, they kind of get on with their living and they plateau a little bit. And although their, their diagnosis is still correct, and prognosis, um, they may have a little more time uh, to get on with their living. And, and so we didn't want to discharge these patients and back into the street or into the shelter system. And so our board of directors at St. Elizabeth Foundation allowed us to open what we're calling chronic beds in which um, patients, as they kind of improve could be admitted into that level of services in our program and as they decline <clears throat> they can come back into the hospice um, proper for their end of life but while well on our chronic floor they still have access to all the good um, pain symptom management uh, the staff um, have eyes on them and they're able to enjoy all the complementary therapies and, and food uh, cooked by our volunteers and so it's still a beautiful space uh, for them to get on with their living. And it's proved to be a, a successful pilot as we currently are full on both sites, on both floors. And then um, in 2022, um, we opened a satellite of Journey Home Hospice. And again, that was the goal. We didn't think it would happen this quickly, but um, we were invited by the city of Windsor uh, and our hosts organization, Assisted Living Southwestern Ontario, to come and open a three bed pilot in the city to see what it would look like to scale down from a 10 bed model, a smaller city, and perhaps in the future going to a city that might need to us, for us to scale up the number of, of beds. And so that um, is working very well. And, and I guess, unfortunately, uh, and that we are at full capacity in, in during this pilot phase and have been. And then just recently, um, I'm proud to announce that we have been able to establish an outreach nurse navigator who is able to connect with our partners in the community. And this was so critical, we found over the last five years, that we needed this individual um, who could build those relationships with whether it be the hospital, the emergency rooms, um, shelter systems, or other partners who are making referrals, that they can go in in real time um, and speak with the patient, talk about their desired quality of life, their desire for care, show them a virtual tour that you'll see in a few minutes of the hospice so that they, they see it's not a scary place or a dark place, it's, it's a beautiful space, uh, and, to, and to share more about the programs because a lot of the folks we're serving are extremely fearful of the healthcare system. They may not have been treated the way they wanted to be or the way they should be, in, in various settings. And, and so there's a fear of coming into institutional care. And so we were able to only do this, uh, these, you know, the, this is not a funded uh, program by the government. Um, and so we were only able to offer this nurse navigator um, because of the generosity of Share Life. And so I, on behalf of our organization, I just wanna thank you for enabling this to happen. And we're seeing the, 
the, the fruits um, of this position in that uh, we're totally at full capacity at all our sites. In 2023, we're also able um, to offer wellness day programming uh, to patients. And so the idea behind that is that um, folks may not be ready to come into a hospice setting, but how, as I said earlier, how can we, how can you get involved in your hospice earlier on uh, upon diagnosis? And so maybe you're not ready for residential home setting, but, but you may benefit from, or this patient may benefit from coming to a wellness program. Maybe it's gentle exercise or foot care or all those modalities that might help their quality of life for them to get on with their living until such a time that they're ready to come to the residential home at Germany. Next slide, please. So if, if, you, if you have a few minutes, I'd love to share some videos. Sometimes I can go on and on and talk about our, our space, and, um, but sometimes seeing is believing. And fortunately, I couldn't have all of you at the hospice today to give you a tour, but uh, I thought it important that you see the space, that you see the attention to detail uh, that our volunteer project managers, uh, Joan and Terry McSweeney, uh, put into it. Our, our lead artist, Lisa Bastien, who every piece of art you'll see on the tour uh, was created specifically for the space, for Journey Home Hospice, with our patient population. In mind. And so, and as well, you'll see the donors' names who supported uh, the capital project uh, in 2020. So, I hope you enjoy the tour. Welcome to Journey Home Hospice, Toronto's only hospice for people who have experienced homelessness and vulnerable housing. As you enter the hospice, you will notice the living room and reception area. We have volunteers daily who welcome patients, family and visitors, helping them to feel at home from their first moments in our space. The fireplace area brings a feeling of warmth and comfort to our hospice and also showcases the memorial candle, keeping vigil for the people who have stayed with us. Nearby, the memorial wall holds the names of each person who has called Journey Home Hospice their home, reminding our hospice family of the lives we have been privileged to touch. The heart of our hospice is the kitchen and dining area with an eat-in bar, complemented by private and group dining options. Volunteers prepare three home-cooked meals daily and have a variety of freshly baked snacks available throughout the day, ensuring all of our patients, visitors, and guests feel at home. The solarium off the dining room features a group gathering space for private meetings, playing games, or just enjoying the beautiful city views. Bedrooms at Journey Home Hospice have been designed with patient needs in mind, from transforming beds that quickly convert into a chair at the press of a button, to private storage space and guest seating. These suites offer a quiet oasis of peace for each resident at the hospice. Our wellness room offers a gathering space for complementary therapies such as art and music therapy, scrapbooking and legacy work helping patients to create lasting tributes of their life stories. This is also a space for movie and games nights at the hospice, helping residents to feel at home and part of the larger hospice family. The reflection room is a peaceful, meditative space where patients, family and visitors can find time for self-reflection and stillness. Featuring custom artwork created just for Journey Home Hospice, the Reflection Room is truly a panoramic escape in the middle of the city. Journey Home Hospice offers a safe, welcoming space to patients, their family members, and their extended networks of loved ones, with 24-7 hospice care for people approaching end of life. This is truly a space created by the community for the community. We are grateful to each and every person who has helped to create the Journey Home Hospice and look forward to welcoming our patients home. From the tour itself and the visuals, you get a sense um, of the space. 
and we're not a large space. It's a, I think we're just around, just over 3,000 square feet. Um, it, it really provides a beautiful environment um, for end of life journeys. And I'm, I'm really proud to say that many, many, many patients come in. Again, they're given a tour prior virtually, but when they come in and they're introduced to the common areas and, and brought to their room, we often give them a few minutes to get adjusted to the space and acclimatized um, to the new reality of, of everything, their diagnosis. This is the last place they're going to, to reside. All those things they're processing. Uh, and, and so many times uh, we've come back and, and the patients are, have said, this is for me. This is all for me. And, and it, it brings great joy to those of us dedicated to this movement to see uh, the gratitude. The next video uh, we're going to show um, is Peter's story. And um, if our audio is working, you'll get to hear from Peter. And, and Peter uh, was a patient of ours. And normally, I am not a supporter of filming patients or asking them to be filmed to tell their story. But Peter asked us um, to tell his story. And he, he wanted to do it for a few reasons. One was to, to let people know the story. Second was that he could help other people in similar situations, um, uh, that they not be afraid to accept our care. And so uh, we're very grateful to Peter for sharing his story. So here's Peter's story. Well, obviously, you know what it is, you know how it is, and you know where I am. I'm here because I'm dying from cancer. Um, I mean, I've run a pretty hardcore life, you know, to run in the streets. I'm not caring about anybody or anything but myself. I have been a nurse for many, many years, and I've just seen the phenomenal need that people have at the end of life care. And so when we think about people who are living on the street, when most people want to die at home, if you don't have a home, where do you go to die? And so what should we as a society be doing for them? And I think that's one thing here at Journey Home Hospice, we're trying to tackle two really tough societal issues, right? Nobody likes to talk about dying, and nobody likes to deal with the issue of homelessness. How's your pain today? Four. How do you like Well, obviously, you know what it is, you know how it is, and you know where I am. I'm here because I'm dying from cancer. Um, I mean, I've run a pretty hardcore life, you know, to run in the streets. I'm not caring about anybody or anything but myself. I have been a nurse for many, many years, and I've just seen the phenomenal need that people have at the end of life care. And so when we think about people who are living on the street, when most people want to die at home, if you don't have a home, where do you go to die? And so what should we as a society be doing for them? And I think that's one thing here at Journey Home Hospice, we're trying to tackle two really tough societal issues, right? Nobody likes to talk about dying, and nobody likes to deal with the issue of homelessness. How's your pain today? Four. How do you like the current uh, dose? Well, it's, it's good because I had sleep. Oh, good. What was your normal like routine before? On the street? Oh, yeah. yeah. Whatever I wanted, whatever I needed, I'd use drugs, street drugs, to, to kill the, the pain. So I'd be able to sleep. I'm yeah. so glad that I'm here, right? Yeah. It's a gift and it's a privilege to 
work with folks as they are in the last perhaps days, might be months of their life, to ensuring that that time is as quality time as we can give them. It's, it's really a privilege to be along a person's journey as they're approaching end of life, no matter what background they're coming from or whatever place they're coming from, it is an absolute privilege. I love working here. It's something that I always wanted to do. I love to care for people at the end of their lives. The patients that come in, um, most of them don't have anyone. And we become that family. And we just love them. I like their own. One patient, I went into his room and the nurse was busy and I, when she came in, she said, oh, he's dying. And I'm like, no, she said yes. And we moved him onto the bed. Five minutes later, he was gone. And I felt bad because um, I didn't know. So, I didn't know. I didn't know this head. Looking at our team, it takes a special person to work here. It's a non judgmental location. We want to open our arms and our doors to welcome people and support them the best that we can. Hey, Peter. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing today? Not bad, not bad. Not bad, not bad. Some of those medication changes have helped. Yes, Pain a little definitely. bit better controlled. Definitely. Good, good, good. Yes. And you're being careful when you're walking. The snow's yeah, here. It's getting icy out there. It's pretty slippery outside, so you want to be careful. That's yes, you sure. do. I don't have my snow tires on yet. <laughs> Get them changed up. Yeah, <laughs> we'll do that. I woke up one day on a park bench. I did my you know what I was usually doing my hit a drug to get my pain under control and it didn't it wasn't working I, I couldn't stand up I st it took me 20 minutes 25 minutes for a five minute walk where I knew where the hospital was they took some blood work and admitted me ASAP and they did a CAT scan they did all kinds of MRIs they did uh, whatever tests known to man for to see what it was that was killing me don't be kicking me out now for saying this but the last few days have been really good, really, really good. The medications that they're prescribing me is just starting to gel now. The doctors in here are great, phenomenal. If, if we could just keep it at this level, I'd be grateful. Hello. The number of individuals experiencing homelessness is increasing and uh, we're concerned it's gonna to continue to increase. It doesn't take much in order to, unfortunately, lose your home. And so I, I do see there's a role for maybe smaller versions of a journey home hospice that completes the specialization and the, the focus for those experiencing structural vulnerability and having them in other communities to make sure that we are looking at this population and providing them the same level of care that anybody else would be offered. Everybody deserves good palliative care at end of life. And so people who are unfortunately experiencing homelessness or living on the street, we don't know what their backstory is, but they deserve the best palliative care as possible. And this is a place that can afford that to them. And so we thank Peter for sharing that his story with us and leaving this legacy um, for us and to us. The last story uh, is a shorter story, um, and it's Nicole's story. And Nicole was uh, one of our first patients at Journey Home. And Nicole's story, um, you know, is powerful because I think it reminds the viewer that, uh, you know, that sort of the saying by, by the grace of God go I, and that really um, when you hear her story, you realize this could be any one of us on the call today or a family member or a friend. And that, um, you know, we, as Dr. Bergeron said in the video last, you know, we, we don't know people's stories and we don't know everyone's full history. And so uh, ensuring we can provide good hospice cloud of care to all 
Canadians is uh, what we're what we're striving to achieve. And and so um, let's listen to Nicole's story. You could be a soccer mom driving your SUV, and next thing you know, you're an addict on the street. I got married, had a great job. My husband at the time was very abusive, and he ended up hitting me in the back with a hammer. So I got prescribed Oxy-80. The addiction escalated. I lost the place, and I lost my job. Never imagined they'd take my kids away. And for me now to have cancer, I don't want to die an addict without my children and without having some kind of quality of life because otherwise I would die on the street and no one would know that I'm just a normal person that had a hard time, right? So I thank you um, for your patience of, of taking in the tour. I hope captures the space for you, but also listening to the stories of both Peter and Nicole, who we were privileged to serve and who taught us a great deal. You know, that uh, as, as this is new um, to the hospice palliative care movement, uh, creating specialized care uh, for Canadians, um, we were learning daily uh, from our patients. And so we're, we're grateful to them as well uh, for entrusting us with their care. And then um, just the last slide or the next slide, uh, you know, folks might ask, well, um, I feel uh, touched by this work. I want to get involved in this work. Um, how can I get involved? Uh, and so uh, selfishly, I'd love all of you to come and, and <laughs> volunteer with us at Journey Home Hospice in, in Toronto. But if you're not able or it's uh, you're, you're outside the downtown core and travel is challenging, there's all kinds of opportunities um, to get involved in not just our hospice, but, but your local community hospice um, to volunteer. Many hospices, including ours, have roles such as uh, hospitality, so helping make those beautiful meals you saw in the videos, uh, snacks, baking, uh, making sure there's always hot coffee and tea and soups available. Uh, there's companion roles. So journeying with the, with the patient, you know, playing cards, doing puzzles, maybe reading, um, reading scripture, reading uh, text, whatever it might be. Reception volunteers helping answer the door, welcome folks into the hospice, um, help with administrative tasks as needed, et cetera. And if folks aren't able to volunteer, um, with us or any hospice, uh, if you're able, there's financial opportunities. As I said earlier, hospices are not fully funded. Hospices who have residential care receive some funding that, that covers the, the nursing and the PSW care, but it, it doesn't cover things like electricity and equipment and food and complementary therapies. And, and so we really rely on the generosity of organizations and individuals like Share Life. Um, who believe in this work and support this work um, through their financial generosity. And so I think we're coming to the end of my time because I talk too much. And so um, I think Chris is going to lead us in, in some moderation of questions that folks might have. That's right. Thank you very much, Father Matthew. And uh, so we invite everybody, if you haven't already, to please uh, submit your questions just using the Q&A function. This is, of course, only open to those who are joining us via Zoom. Um, one of the questions that uh, we received beforehand, Father Matthew, and, and first of all, thank you very much for sharing uh, the importance of, of uh, Share Life supporters, many of which are tuned in uh, right now, um, letting them know that, um, that, their, that their contributions are supporting what you're doing. So thank you very much for, uh, for having explained that. Um, one of the questions that we received is uh, the difference between hospice and palliative care in a hospital or in a home, and if there's any distinctions between those. For sure. And it, it's confusing because of uh, hospice palliative care and palliative care and palliative care units. And, and so um, 
at the end of the day, it's all of those uh, are about end of life care. So the, under the umbrella of end of life care, and then specifically how the, that care model is, is delivered. And so in hospice palliative care or hospice care, it's uh, usually community-based uh, provided by a community agency or a hospice that is supported by entire interdisciplinary team um, looking at a holistic approach to care and supported by a huge volunteer network who, who, who the hospice movement sees as essential to the, to the program. And so that could be day programming, that could be day hospice, uh, that could be residential hospice care at, for end of life, at three months life expectancy. And so that's hospice palliative care. You then have uh, palliative care units in hospitals uh, that provide excellent care to folks. Uh, who uh, sometimes um, the needs of the patient cannot be cared for in a residential hospice setting. And so when you think about who would be admitted to a hospice residential setting, it's someone whose care could be, their, their care needs could be provided in their home if they could still be at home. And sometimes people can't be at home even when they want to be because maybe um, they're very sick and, the, and the, the space does not allow for the patient to stay at home for their end of life. Maybe the family is exhausted because the patient has um, been suffering for years uh, with their illness. And now the family is exhausted and needs that wraparound care as well. Um, and so they could go to a residential home if needed. But if the needs were more that could be cared for in a home setting, um, such as intervention, medical interventions or IVs, et cetera, then um, the care team would probably suggest a palliative care unit in which the hospital was able, would be able to provide. And then you have palliative care, and, and most Canadians are receiving palliative care in their home, and that's what we heard from Canadians they want, if at all possible. And so palliative care at home is offered by home care agencies, such as St. Elizabeth, in partnership with the Ministry of Health through the Home and Community Care Services, and supported often in partnership with a local hospice uh, as the hub of hospice care in that community. So we, we work together but it, they're sort of distinct entities uh, within the end of life care. Okay. Um, now there's a lot of great questions that are, that are coming in right now. Um, uh, uh, one viewer said, thank you for sharing the story of Journey Home Hospice. We want to enroll in every diocese across the country so that uh, every person has a choice to have excellent palliative care. And that raises the question, um, what is the what is the wait list like? What are maybe some of the unmet needs that are out there? If you're saying that you're full, um, what are we looking at in terms of of the needs that aren't being met that that maybe we as a community should be rallying to support? So in terms of our specific population for journey home, being homeless and vulnerably housed, um, you know our 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 hope is that one day as a as a city as a province as a country will eradicate homelessness and that uh, we'll have plenty of other folks to serve if they if we're out of business so to speak um, that's our desire but we know that's not happening right now and that there are folks in need and so um, there is conversations around if there's community support um, you know the what is the desire for us to expand services across the gta for this specific population in terms of the general population, uh, we know there's a great need across the province for additional hospice services. In fact, um, Hospice Palliative Care Ontario, which is our governing body of every hospice in the province, uh, you know, suggests we need an additional 500 hospice beds in our province uh, to care for the, the needs of now and the future of, of, a, of an aging population. Okay, so that is that is a significant need. Um, the um, there was a question about the second hospice supporting uh, homeless individuals. Uh, can you share anything more about that? The other one in in Windsor, Ontario. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So that uh, that was um, uh, opened in November of uh, this past year, twenty twenty two, and again it was uh, we we had a desire to open additional sites or. or satellite sites to serve other communities and also to test the model. Could this be scaled down you know, in smaller communities like Windsor or Sault Ste. Marie or Sudbury um, where the need is great, but, but the population isn't as large as the GTA. 
And so uh, we've been able, now we're just seven months into the pilot, uh, to test the model, uh, to adjust staffing and program requirements, and, and, uh, and it has been successful, um, I can say, and unfortunately full uh, since we opened in November. All right. Um, so many questions here that are um, uh, really quite excellent. Um, now, I, I know that we don't want to get too much into the questions about MADE because I think that that's a, um, uh, a different topic that, that certainly deserves a lot of attention, but uh, we really want to focus on palliative care. But um, um, someone is asking, uh, well, they're saying that they've heard that hospices are performing euthanasia and what how does a catholic hospice approach that question um if they're say is a request so I, I can't speak for all hospices um across the province i i do know that uh, different hospices boards of directors are approaching it differently from uh, everything from the hospice would not be provided at the site, at the hospice, uh, too, that uh, MAID could be provided on the site, but that the hospice staff would not, they would back off and remove themselves uh, during the procedure or the act of MAID. Uh, and then uh, third, um, there are some hospices uh, allowing, per, performing the act of MAID on premises or from the hospice team. Um, so from a, from a journey home perspective, I'm, I'm happy to to say, and, and one day if I go back to school, I'll do a study uh, that uh, in our five years of operations and the hundreds of folks we've served, um, no one has requested made. And so I think as a society, um, you know, it goes back to Nancy's uh, line in, in the video, Peter's story of you know, tackling two societal issues of dying and, and homelessness. And, and we would think that the population we're serving at Journey Home would have nothing sort of physical or monetary to live for. There's no possessions and money and homes and cars and all those things. Yet, in fact, um, this population is not asking for, for aid. But in a, in a, hosp in a uh, Catholic setting, a Catholic hospice setting, uh, the hospice would uh, have to make uh, effective referral. Um, that is the law. Uh, and the patient would have access to that to MAID um, or the conversation with those providing MAID, uh, but the uh, procedure would not happen uh, on site and the staff would not be involved. In, and so what happens is that patients in Catholic settings would be, uh, my understanding, would be transferred to a partner organization. Um, but, but during that transition, uh, their pain and symptoms and their whole person would be taken into account. Uh, they're, they're not abandoned, uh, but rather the hope always is that, that maybe the individual will change their mind and embrace good hospice palliative care and pain and symptom management before choosing me. Okay. Um, a few very quick questions, and we can kind of just kind of go through them one by one. Uh, first of all, can you say again, Father, how many beds are at Journey Home Hospice? Uh, all together on our two sites, we have 16 beds. So we have uh, 10 hospice beds in downtown Toronto with three chronic hospice beds in downtown Toronto in the same location or same building, different floors, and then three in Windsor, Ontario. Okay. And what is the current wait list right now to, to get into Journey Home? So the, unfortunately, there's always a, a wait list. Uh, so we work with community partners uh, and uh, normally coming from often um, our hospital partners uh, that the individual has experienced some kind of uh, traumatic episode or something that has brought them to emerge. And so we work with our partners to provide uh, excellent care to the individual until they can be transferred into our care at Journey. Okay, so that answers another question that we've received about how um, how individuals are um, uh, are selected uh, to be uh, referred to uh, Journey Home Hospice. Um, turning to hospice care, more generally speaking, if someone is looking for a uh, a faith based hospice, um, is there resources that can help with that? Is the Hopeline maybe something that can help with that? For sure, and then 
when folks are, are encountering the journey of end of life diagnosis, uh, that, that was the intention of the Hope Plan to turn to, uh, to get that advice, to, to ask questions about what that particular hospice in that city or region, what services are available, uh, and whether it be in the hospice or the hospital or the community. And, and not just end of life care, but other resources that are needed at end of life, such as you know meals on wheels and transportation services and getting a haircut in your house because you can't get out. And you know all those kinds of things that we take for granted. Um, and, uh, how do you access those services as well in your local community? And uh, just to address quickly a question, uh, there was a question about um, whether the Hope Line is something that can be used to provide services uh, for for those who have a home. And and yes, this is a, this is a resource that that is out there for for you, for me, for everyone uh, in the community to be able to to access uh, palliative care services. Is that right, Father? Hundred percent, Chris. Uh, that's I think that's going to be the bulk of folks that we serve through the Hope Line. It's going to be folks who want to stay home. Um, in their home and with those wraparound supports coming into the home as much as possible. And so just being uh, that resource to folks. And so, you know, I, I want to clarify the Hope Line is not a service coordinator, is not, is not providing direct care or service coordination, but rather is helping connect individuals with resources available in their community um, to, to create that care plan for them, but, but not doing direct patient care or service coordination. Now you talk about wraparound care and also meeting the the spiritual needs of of, of patients. What uh, what does that look like at Journey Home? Um, are, is mass and sacraments available to the patients? I, I know that they would be coming from from different backgrounds. How do you go about meeting those spiritual needs, which is something that's a lot less um, tangible, maybe than than trying to meet um, medical needs? For sure. And a lot of folks that come into our care um, have uh, been estranged from their faith community or faith traditions. And so first uh, we, you know, as they come into our care, asking simple questions about what is their background? Can we, can we help facilitate uh, whatever their faith? We are a multi-faith um, agency, a facility in which we serve all people in need. And so uh, if, if they wish to have communion, uh, if they wish to uh, participate in mass, if they're physically able, uh, then we have volunteers who take uh, patients to a local parish. We have arranged for sacraments, uh, including baptism uh, at end of life for folks. Um, we, we have great connections with our uh, faith partners and other denominations and all other faiths um, that can also come and help and serve our patients at the hospitals. It's crucial. I mean, that the whole idea of wraparound services and holistic care is, is that as humans, we're not just, it's not just about physical uh, pain, but what, what about existential and, and spiritual pain? And that's a big part of a lot of folks' journeys, particularly when you spent a life uh, filled with trauma, uh, uh, addiction, uh, behavioral issues, and mental health challenges. So uh, it's spiritual care is just as important as uh, as, the, as the pain and symptom management. Now, um, uh, I know this one is kind of getting into sort of like maybe a, a tricky um, uh, ethical questions, but um, there's a lot of confusion out there um, about um, withdrawing, um, withdrawing feeding tubes, um, what, what is considered, um, I guess, ethically permissible in terms of withdrawing treatments, um, what is considered um, hastening death versus um, something that is an, an unnecessary to uh, to to prolong the life of someone? Uh, um, how how do you go about addressing these kinds of questions, Father? Well, it's um, they, these are not uh, easy um, situations, and and they're not black and white all the time. And so we do have experts uh, in our faith community, like Dr. Moyer McQueen, and. Canadian Catholic Bioethics Institute to help um, when these, some of these questions are challenging. But, but at the end of the day, it's really about um, you know, what are extraordinary means? What are, what are what, what's it, you know, machines and things that, um, that are just prolonging life to no end, you know, that 
there's not going to be an improvement or life increasing in life quality of life and so uh, removing things like feeding tubes and hydration uh, are all um, permissible in, in the moral teachings of the Catholic Church uh, because they are considered extraordinary measures, particularly for at end of life. And so we do have you know, all kinds of tools in our arsenal these days in palliative care to ensure that the patient is comfortable, that they are receiving excellent pain symptom management, and that they're not suffering in those measures at their request or at the request of their power of attorney or, or substitute decision maker is requested. You're very good. Thank you, uh, Father Matthew. Um, now, we did get a question. Uh, will this a link of this recording be available so that it could be shared with clergy and bishops, friends across the country? Yes, absolutely. Um, for all our registered participants, we will be sharing sharing a, a link of this recording. We'll also be posting it on our social media. So please share it uh, uh, far and wide. Um, we have run out of time. Um, I want to thank you so much, Father Matthew, for um, for this very, um, uh, I know it's a very emotional topic. It's a difficult topic. Um, I'm so grateful that, um, you know, over 100 people are joining us to uh, think about these very, very important questions and to hear about your work. Uh, and I'm so grateful for the work that you're doing, Father, I had the chance to visit Journey Home Hospice during the blessing ceremony, and I was thinking, my goodness, how how did this not exist before? Um, and it really made me think of like, wow, this this really needs to be everywhere. Um, but uh, but you're you know one of the pioneers of this, and so um, I think on behalf of everybody who's joined us, I think we're we're all very very grateful for for what you do. Um, I also want to uh, thank uh, my colleague, Jennifer Lazo, who is uh, responsible for um, all of the, the details of organizing our Share Life Speaker Series. Thank you so much, uh, Jen, for, um, for troubleshooting um, all of the different uh, technical aspects as well. Uh, we're really grateful. And, and thank you to all of our participants. Um, I know many of you are Share Life supporters and and you've been able to hear the impact of your support of, of Share Life. Um, um, our Share Life Parish campaign, we're, we've, we've passed the 60% mark um, of our annual appeal. And so we're gonna keep pushing. Uh, please encourage your fellow parishioners to support, um, support Share Life. Um, now, Father, um, we'd love you to be able to close us in prayer. And we actually had a specific request. If uh, in that prayer, uh, you could also pray for Pray for those of us uh, who are suffering and those of us who, who have loved ones who, who are suffering. Thank you, Chris. So let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for your presence with us this evening. As we depart from this space now, this virtual space, we ask you to bless us throughout the remaining evening and the days to come. Do not let the learnings and the conversations of this gathering fade, but instead, may they continue to ruminate within us and bear fruit in our lives throughout the year until we find ourselves together again at the next Share Life Speakers event. Let us keep in mind, and please Lord, keep close to your heart, those who are suffering, those who journey with those who are suffering, that they feel your grace, your love, your peace and your hope and we ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you very much, Father Matthew, and thank you to all our friends joining us from wherever you are. I hope you all have a great night.